slightly early. I'm a minute early on. No, I'm not five o'clock exact. So welcome to ARC Online again. Alas, COVID has kept us away from meeting face to face once again. But we won't be stopped. And uh, as rudimentary as this is, not exactly what you'd call studio quality, but it's the best we can manage. So bear with me and tonight we will carry on in the Gospel of John and we're going to look at the first part of John chapter 7. It's good to remember that in the original text there are no chapter divisions or no verses. All of those things were put in for convenience later to help us to quickly go to a particular section or to share something or to tell someone else where to find something. But as the Gospels were written, these divisions are not actually there. The reason it's important to think of that is to bear in mind what God has been saying over the preceding chapters, and particularly the last couple of weeks of, of lesson, from really from feeding the 5,000 onwards. It's important to understand tonight's lesson really as a continuation. I know it sounds uh, obvious that of course it's a continuation, it's the next chapter, but people are of the habit of thinking that because the chapter changed that now we're onto something different. Not so much. Okay, so the story continues and the message from the previous chapters likewise continues tonight. So it's entitled Going to Tabernacles. Jesus observes Sukkot. Remember Sukkot is just the is the proper Hebrew word for what you call either tabernacles or some people call it booths. Okay, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Proper name is Sukkot. So he goes to Sukkot, even though it's not time for him to fulfill it. The alternate title for tonight, and I guess the one I put on the, the on the YouTube, is the ongoing message that God started to speak to us from, as I've just shared, about how important it is to be on His agenda, not your own agenda, and not just on His agenda, but on His timing as well. Because humans are, <laughs> well, if you work with children or if you have your own children, you'll not, and when they want it, they want it now. <laughs> and the church is no different, and it's never been any different, and probably will be uh, no different till the end of time as we know it. Humans do not understand how important it is to God that everything proceeds exactly as he has already spoken at the proper time in the proper order because he has a lot more to contend with than just your life by itself as if the other billions of people weren't there. You imagine what kind of juggling act it is for God to balance what you want with what everyone around you wants and with what he wants and to somehow show himself faithful, wise and true, the, the one and only and perfect God and King. Answering your prayers, you get the idea now, but according to what is right and when is right and how is right not just what we first thought of. I think it was last week we uh, we looked at the scripture, you know, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. We always think we know best. And we're very good at lecturing God. Keep an eye out for this when you're praying. Catch yourself telling God what he ought to do, as if he needed your advice. <laughs> but we all do it, right? We get frustrated. So we do it. It's always good to remind ourselves that God doesn't actually need our counsel. It's we who need his counsel. 
So let's uh, pray and then we'll we'll get stuck into it. It's not that long tonight, hopefully, by my standards, so uh, we will pray and get right into it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Yeshua, Jesus, your Son, without whom we would not have the gospel, without whom we would not have hope of salvation, nor, Lord, would we have a high priest who understands what it is to be human, who understands our condition, to whom we can petition and appeal, who understands what our hearts feel and know what we long for and the struggles of our lives here in this world. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you promised that you yourself would be our teacher. So as we proceed, Lord, in John 7, I pray and ask that you would, by your Spirit, write into every mind and every heart that hears it the things that you want them to know, the things that you need them to know. Lord, that you would transform us all by the truth, that you would transform us all by your word, so that we would fall into step with you, not be running ahead, nor be found lagging behind, but would be at your heel, following as every good sheep ought to follow the good shepherd. We pray in Jesus' name, knowing that you are able. Amen. Amen. So, John 7. As we go into this, it's important to uh, note God's timing for us to arrive here. It's actually, you're aware of God's overall calendar for mankind, established in its type as the annual cycle of feasts for Israel. And those of you who've been around for a while will know by now that all there are two main groups of feasts, those in the spring, then there's a long pause during the summer, and then as autumn comes, or fall if you're American, then we get the autumn feast, which are to do with the second coming. So Jesus has fulfilled completely all of the things that the spring holy days point to. So that begins with Passover and ends at um, Shavuot, which you know better as Pentecost. Okay, So all the many things in that period prescribed in the law, for Israel to remember every year, Jesus has fulfilled everything to do with the spring. He has partly or begun to fulfill things to do with the autumn, particularly anything that requires a death. For instance, um, which we'll speak about in a second, Yom Kippur, requires a scapegoat to die. So Jesus died once for all. So he's already done the dying as the sacrifice even for the autumn holy days he doesn't have to come back and be a sacrifice again so we can say the spring holy days are completely fulfilled which are to do with the first coming and the autumn holy days have had a partial or the beginnings of fulfillment by his sacrifice but they are far from fulfilled they will be fulfilled as the second coming approaches and they will reach their fulfillment by his return. We are in the autumn holy days. Remember, it's autumn if you're in Israel. Not autumn if you're in Philippines or autumn if you're in New Zealand. The time that matters is what time is it in Jerusalem. So, right now, the autumn holy day cycle has begun. It begins with Yom Teruah, better known to you as the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was a call to assemble. So the trumpets were blown from the temple and all Israel was to gather, to assemble before the Lord. What follows, so that was, uh, that was the other day last week, okay? So what follows is... 10 days that are very different from any other 10 days in the year. So we are, strictly speaking, that on the calendar, that's what we're in, as I'm talking to you now, on the 11th of September. It, we are still in this 10-day period. And it's called uh, Yamin Nora'im, the Days of Awe, in which we are supposed to fast, we are supposed to get super real with ourselves 
Remember Paul said, examine yourself to see if you are really in the faith? Well, the reference for that is what I'm talking about, the days of awe. That's what you're supposed to do in the days of awe. Called to assemble, not for a party, quite the reverse. The days of awe are supposed to bring tears. The, the days of awe is supposed to be a time where you are so brutally honest with yourself about yourself in the presence of God. So it's called the days of awe because we are supposed to see God clearly as he really is. You know on the day of judgment it's not like having to account to your mother if your mother said be home early and you got home late. We all know what that's like, right? It can be scary. But <laughs> nothing compared to sinful man having to account to perfect, holy, and fearsome God, you know, who is impartial. He can't, he doesn't accept excuses. Either you will have heard him in this life and become and done everything you needed to to be a faithful Christian, or you didn't. There's no in between. And at the judgment it's too late. So the days of war are for appreciating that fact and then seeing ourselves in light of who he really is. Remember, Jesus is the Saviour, but he is Echad with the Father. Actually, his whole character is identical to the Father's. So don't think Jesus doesn't get angry or that he won't um, judge. He does. It's only at the first coming the more merciful side of his character is reveal, revealed uh, primarily. At the second coming, he doesn't come the same way, does he? This time he comes as the avenging king, one like the son of David, you know? So he comes as the warrior king like King David to avenge, to rescue the remnant of his people and to destroy his enemies. You do not want to be on the wrong side of Jesus, gentle Jesus, when he comes back, okay? He and the Father are Echad. So in this 10 day period, we are supposed to do a lot of soul searching. We are supposed to examine ourselves. This is purely between us and God, no one else. And we are to fix, as far as it's up to us, anything we find unsatisfactory. In other words, the sin we discover, the things we discover that we're, our conscience is pricked by, by the Holy Spirit, you know, if, if you were suddenly before God today, would you be happy about it? If the answer is no, then that's what this time is for. It's so you have time to do something about it before you are in front of Him. Because we will all be in front of Him in the end. So at the end of the ten days, everyone in Israel, which foreshadows everyone on the planet, because remember, God created these things for Israel to instruct the nations. We are supposed to learn from them. As Paul says, these things were given for our instruction. Okay, so it doesn't just apply to Israel. It's specifically applied to them, but it's, it tells us about God and how he will deal with mankind in general. So at the end of the ten days comes a particular day. And... That day is Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is especially important. On the Day of Atonement, that is the day that the scapegoat is killed. Okay, it's a whole long teaching which we've done several times, so I'll just trust that you know it already, but the quick the two second version is a couple of goats are selected, one of them is chosen by lot, that means by, you know, roll of a dice or whatever, so it's, it's, a, they, it's God choosing, not you. And then the high priest will lay his hands on that the head of that goat and symbolically impart to it all the sins of the nation. So it's like a ritual gesture, but it, the Jews at the time did not understand and probably still don't understand now, it's God saying what would happen, and in fact did happen at the first coming, where Jesus, the scapegoat, we're used to him as the Passover lamb, right? 
It is also the Yom Kippur goat. The sins of all God's people were laid upon him so that he bore the punishment for those sins instead of you. Substitutionary atonement it's called. That's the $20 word for it. But it means he took your place to satisfy the law. The law could not be cancelled. The law is never cancelled. can only be satisfied. Having made the law, God himself keeps it. So he couldn't just change the law to suit you. The law has to be satisfied. And those parts of the law that you've broken that require your death, someone had to die, if not you, someone instead of you, Jesus of Nazareth instead of you. Okay? So the scapegoat dies at Yom Kippur. All those who have done what God asked in the ten days, which is to repent, to get rid of sin as far as it's up to them, and return to his way. In the Old Testament version, so before Jesus comes, something interesting happens, right? If you have done that, if you have obeyed God about those days, your name was considered to be written in the book of life so the Lamb's book of life is not a new invention in the New Testament it's Old Testament as well on Yom Kippur if you were obedient and faithful to God and had repented in those 10 days of the things he pointed out to you by his spirit then your name was written in the book of life in heaven so there's no book on the earth right just it was considered that your name would be in the book of life for just one year. Why just one year? Well, because all of this is an annual process, over and over again every year. The blood of the scapegoat, the actual goat, you know, the four-legged variety, could only cover over the sin for one year. Then another scapegoat had to die. That's why Paul is so uh, urgent on having the Jewish people understand that God's scapegoat, being such a pure and perfect and complete sacrifice, only had to die once for all, because he could, Messiah, could not just cover the sin over, he could take it away. Because remember, one of the promises of the new covenant is that I will remember your sin no more. The sin and iniquity I will remove from you, I will remember it no more okay so that's a major difference between the, the old testament scapegoat and the real messiah that the scapegoat only pointed to jesus has done it once for all after that a week after that we come to where we are in john 7 so actually in the in our previous weeks we've been talking about him feeding the 5,000, and all of the things I've just been talking about have been going on in Jerusalem. Because the actual scapegoat and all the rest, of course, that all happens at the temple. So we pick up the story, we pick up uh, John 7, at the time where Yom Kippur has happened, and we're in that week before the next, and really it's essentially the last major uh, festival of the calendar, the main calendar, which is booths, or tabernacles, your Bible might say. It's, and remember, its proper name is Sukkot. Okay, so let's go to John 7 now, verse 1. After this, so in other words, after the things we read about in chapter 6. Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to kill him. Just so you understand, it's all Israel. These are just provinces. Right? So if you're in the Philippines, you understand what a province is, how the, this one country, many provinces, same in Israel. So Judea was the province around Jerusalem. Galilee is to the north around the Sea of Galilee, okay, and because there was a, a 
a significant population of non-Jews there, brought in by the Roman Empire. That your Bible, you'll read about it, sometimes referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. That's why it's still Israel, but it's called Galilee of the Gentiles because unlike the rest of the country, if you were in Israel but you weren't Jewish, almost certainly that's where you lived, in Galilee, okay? Back to the story. So he didn't want to go down south to Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, Sukkot was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Even, uh, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival, because my time has not yet fully come. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He is a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. So that's only the section we're doing. So John 7, 1 to, uh, 1 to 13. We're just going to look at the first bit about him not wanting to go into Judea and the things that follow from that. So as I mentioned, the first thing to remember is he didn't go to Galilee, he's already there. The loaves and the fishes miracle happens on the far side of the Sea of Galilee in Galilee. Walking on the water to meet his disciples in the storm remember we did that next that's in the sea of galilee so that's still in galilee right so that's why uh, as i said at the beginning john 7 really is a continuation of chapter 6. as chapter 6 closes and chapter 7 begins we find jesus still in galilee from doing those things this is immediately our continuation okay He's already up there. It says that his brothers make this challenge to him. You know, why don't you go down there and do those things, right? So one of the interesting things is, who are these brothers? It's actually slightly uncertain. There's a couple of things to consider. Joseph and Mary are Jewish. Jewish families were big. This is 30 years later after Jesus is born. We don't really hear much about, you know, specifically about how big, how many other children Joseph and Mary might have had. But most people tend to I'd say it's like the tendency is to assume that these brothers it talks about are biological brothers because it's as I said it's very unlikely that he doesn't have any it's very unlikely that Joseph and Mary would stop with just Jesus this would be very un-Jewish of them to not have a lot of children the second thing is if they're not actual brothers, like the biological brothers, then would we still call them brothers? Would we still call them that? So, obviously, 
you better find out what it is it actually say in the original text, alright? So, in the Greek, because remember it's written in Greek, it uses this word Adelphos. And that word can and generally does mean your actual sibling, your actual biological brother. But it's the same word that you would still use if you meant someone who was so connected to you, with whom you had so much connection, that they were as good as a brother to you. And the Christian church uses this idea to this very day. We have one father. Remember Jesus said, don't call anyone on earth your father. You have one father and he is in heaven. You were born again. So your biological dad is not your father if you're a Christian. The child he had biologically died if you're a Christian and was born again as a child of God. So your dad is still your dad, but your father, from whom you gain your identity and your purpose and all the rest, and hopefully character traits as a new creation, is God in heaven as a child of the Most High. So we all have only one father if we're a Christian, hence we call each other Adelphos, brother or sister, as if you're, obviously if you're a girl you're a sister, not brother, right? The, the text doesn't tell us specifically whether the writer meant, whether John meant bi biological brothers or whether he meant brothers in the church sense. The only clue, and this is probably a big clue, is it says here in verse 5, even his own brothers did not believe in him. Right? So the ones challenging him to go down and show himself, go do some miracles down in Jerusalem. You know, then people of all, you know, if you want to be a public figure, they say, go down and do the things you've been doing here. What, is, what do they mean? Well, he just fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunchbox and walked on the water and calmed the storm and did all those things, right? So that's what they mean. Go and do that in Jerusalem, they're telling them. If you want to be a public figure, if you want to be, you know, big, a big deal, go do it there. And it says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. It's less likely, isn't it, that you would call, that John would be referring to them as brothers in the church sense in the same breath that he says that they don't really believe that he's the Messiah. They don't really believe in him. So whilst it's not 100% clear, I think on balance, it's far more likely that what John means is biological brothers. And that would make sense because Jesus is the eldest in the family. He's the firstborn. Right? And... Mary and Joseph know who he is because the angel told them, remember? They know he's the Messiah. So it's not much of a stretch to imagine that if he has younger brothers, that if he's going off somewhere, that the parents would send these younger brothers with him, whether they really wanted to go or not, okay? To follow him around and learn from him and, you know, Hopefully his influence will rub off on them. So again, whilst it's not 100% absolutely, totally crystal clear, I think the evidence points to these people being his biological brothers, and uh, brothers, Mary being their mother as well, right? rather than them being fellow Christians because of what it says about them not really believing in them. The one thing we can say for certain, though, is they know that it's Tabernacles, Sukkot, and they're saying to him, you should be going down to Jerusalem. And he replies to them, you must go down. You guys must go. Off you go. 
That tells us they're Jewish, right? Beyond question, 100%, that they need to go because it's Sukkot tells us absolutely that they're Jewish, for sure. And that makes a big difference, as we'll see in a minute. The I should I say it now? I'll say it now. I'll probably come back during the set. The reason is, it's the law of Moses. Okay, there are three, um, three of the annual religious occasions, the holy days. If you're an English speak, if you're an English speaker, that's where you get the word holiday from, because originally the only holidays were the holy days, like Easter, right? Only three of them, by the law of Moses, required you to be in Jerusalem at the temple to partake, if you're a male, okay? Only three, Passover, Shavuot, Pentecost, and this one, Sukkot. So, as the, as the scripture here tells us that it's about to be, Shabbat, you know, oh, sorry, about to be um, Sukkot, I get myself confused, about to be Booth. The reason that he's saying to his brothers, you have to go, off you go. He says, I'm not going up at this time, but you have to go, is because it's the law of Moses. They're Jewish men, they don't have any choice. To not go, you needed a really, really good excuse, like you're on your deathbed or something. If you were physically able to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, remember Israel's not, a, even in those days, was not a massive country. It's relatively small. So you might have to walk for a few days, maybe a week, to get there, but unless you had a really impressive excuse, you must go, the whole male population would descend on Jerusalem. That's why in the book of Acts, when the spirit um, fell and the, the uh, apostles go out and speak and start, you know, speaking all the different languages so that these men from all over the Jewish world could hear the gospel in their own language. Did it ever, were you ever wondering why were all these Jews in town? Why were there Jews from all over the empire with all these different languages? Why they were, were they all in Jerusalem anyway? Well, now you know. Because Passover is one of those three pilgrim feasts. So if you're Jewish and you were in the land and you could walk or ride or in some way get there, you had to be there. That's why, the, that's why Jerusalem was packed with people. Absolutely packed. Because virtually the entire male population will be jammed into the city for that time. And Booth is no different. Let's look at what Jesus says to them. The brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. But even his own brothers did not believe in him, as we were just saying. And Jesus says, my time has not yet come, and we'll pick that up again in a second. Okay. It's really common for people to think of the brothers as being a bit wicked. Sure, they don't really believe he's the Messiah, but if you read this in English, it kind of sounds as if they're daring him. You know? As if they're saying, well, you know, it's easy to show off up here in Galilee where no one important lives. You know? It's easy to just, you know, fall this crowd up here, all these country bumpkins or whatever. But if you really want to be great, you need to go to Judea. You need to go to Jerusalem and do it there. If you want to be a notable figure, you know, if you want to be a rock star, 
you need reform on the big stage. That's how they'd probably put it today, right? That's what people tend to think when they read this. And it makes those brothers sound, well, as if they're just daring him, as if they don't really like him, as if it's like, ugh, you know, you've got a big head, you really must be a rock star, what are you doing here? Why don't you go down there and do it, you know? That's what it sounds like in English. It's for this reason uh, that we need to be careful to take note of the context of what's happening. It's never been in question that he should go down to Judea for the reason I just shared. It's about to be Booth. It's about to be Sukkot. So by the law of Moses, because they're all Jewish men, the law of Moses said, you have to go to Judea. Not just to Judea, to Jerusalem. Not just to Jerusalem, to the temple. To take part in this annual event. So the context tells immediately, if you like, takes away this idea that they're just being cheeky or rude. What do they mean then? They're not just taunting him to go and, you know, head on down to the big city. They know. They all have to go, right? So we can dismiss that motivation. They, being Jewish men, know that they all, including him, really should be getting down there, get down to Judea. What does that leave them? Well, the first thing we need to clear up is what do they mean by if you want to become a public figure? Because in modern English, when you read that, especially in modern culture, it's really easy to think they're saying, well, if you want to satisfy your ego, if you want to be, imagine like a modern musician who's got some success in the province, you know? He plays to an audience of 50 most weeks. But his friends say, you know, if, if you want to really be a star, you have to go and play on the big stage in the city. We could all understand that, right? So if you had a big ego and you just wanted to have a lot of fans and you wanted the crowd cheering you and it was all about your ego, then you'd say to that musician, well, you're not going to get that here in the small town. Are you? you need to go play on a big stage in, this, in the main city. That's how most people read this, as if his brothers are saying it in that kind of meaning to him. But we get rescued again by the language. So where it says public figure, it's this Greek word parousia. And it, has a, it doesn't quite mean the same as we think it would mean in English when we talk about a public figure, right? The word itself means to have a, a lasting impression, a, a, a testimony or a witness that leaves a deep impression, a deep and permanent and lasting impression. So you could be a, a public figure, right, like a politician, like we all know politicians, lots of them, they all want to be famous. They all want to be public figures, that's why they became politicians. But as we all know, most of them are as shallow as a puddle. You know, most of them, when they open their mouth and talk, you can just turn the sound off because you're not missing anything. Mostly they don't say anything worth remembering for five minutes, never mind forever. You can be a public figure. You can have a lot of fans without being parousia, without leaving a lasting, deep and permanent impression. Just by being shallow, even though you're popular, right? When we understand what that word is really saying, all of a sudden, the brothers don't sound so unkind anymore. 
what let's just translate then if we can put words in their mouths we don't mean to but if we put it into words in their mouths to make a bit more English sense to what they're saying to him is we all have to go to Jerusalem so when you go down to Judea from here to Jerusalem because it's about to be booths right tabernacles and you have to go we all have to go it's the law you should do the things that you've been doing here in Galilee so that you you leave this lasting permanent impression this conviction on your disciples down there in Judea you should do these miracles down there so that those who are thinking about believing in you will be so impressed that it'll permanently be like a permanent witness to them that's effectively what they're saying so that's way way different isn't it from just taunting him and like daring him I like, dare you to go you know very different what is the problem with that remember how we said there is a way that seems right to a man but it's not always God's way my ways are not your ways says the Lord my ways are higher than your ways my thoughts higher than your thoughts these brothers mean well don't they what they're basically saying is ironically or sadly <laughs> basically the message of the dominionist churches the new apostolic reformation things like that if you hang around those guys or if you have anything to do with them you know they're constantly asking god for power they're always asking god for miracles or the power to do miracles and it's always well not always but it's usually for the same basic reason right remember these groups are usually not particularly interested in this kind of bible study they're not interested in sitting for and listen and really going into what do the words actually say what is the actual message what is god actually saying that requires time and thinking and investment of your you know your day and your life they don't usually like to be that deep the attraction for them is the idea and it's the same idea as Jesus brothers have that's why I'm talking about it is that just do some miracles that's all we need if you just do some miracles then they'll believe if you would just show some power if you would just do some miracles like the ones you've been doing here then that would leave such a lasting impression that they'll all believe well that this, this thinking remains with us to this very day in those kinds of churches who instead of teaching the word instead of looking to what has God actually said they sadly think that they can just shortcut all that and just impress the crowd with a miracle show you know that that will impress them so much they'll all want to be Christians what did Jesus say last time if you remember from last week you know he says even it says from the scripture isn't it that even if someone were to raise themselves up from the dead even then they would not believe that's from the Old Testament right and look what happened Jesus actually did exactly that and did they believe remember when he was raised from the dead you had saints coming up from the grave you had all kinds of things going on the whole of Jerusalem heard that Jesus who they saw die who they saw buried three days later he's up in the flesh not a ghost teaching his disciples and walking around back from the dead so if these brothers and if the new apostolic reformation and those kinds of people now were right you would expect that the whole of the jewish world including the sanhedrin would fall on their faces 
and say, forgive us, you are the Messiah, please can I be a Christian? But we know that that did not happen. On the contrary, the Jewish, the hard-hearted Jewish uh, people hardened their hearts even more. You know? Yes, the church grew rapidly, but the kind of outcome that people assume to this day that you would get, if only there were just miracles all the time, if only God would just show power all the time, it didn't happen, and it never happens. All that supernatural miracles prove is that there is supernatural, honestly. When the Holy Spirit really does things, the word always comes first. It says, these signs shall follow the teaching of the gospel. It's never signs first, teaching second. It's always teaching first, signs second, when it's God. Not only this, Jesus warns us that when Antichrist comes, the false prophet will be given power to work real supernatural signs and wonders, but to support the deception. The signs and wonders will be in support of a false gospel that point people to the Antichrist. You see, signs and wonders in the last days are actually something to be concerned about, worried about. The only way you'll know if it's real, if it's the Holy Spirit or Antichrist, is if you hold it up to the only test that's reliable, which is the Word. So whatever way you go around it, you come back that you have to have the word first. You have to have boring old teaching like this first. Otherwise you can never tell if the supernatural events, should something supernatural occur, and I've seen heaps of supernatural, don't make the mistake of thinking that I am one of those uh, cessationist people. I certainly am not. I've seen God move and I've seen Satan move. I've seen both in abundance. It's a big difference, but you can only tell it apart if you know God by his word to know when it's him. And when it isn't, when it doesn't line up, you know it's the enemy. Back to our John 7. These guys are just, they mean well, right? But that's what they're doing. They're giving him, Jesus the same message as people when they're praying in those church, those kind of churches today. Saying, oh Lord, give us power, give us miracles, give us signs, give us this and that and everything else. They're making the mistake of thinking that that by itself will cause people to want to be Christian. God says, no. Jesus' his son says, no. And history says, no. It doesn't work like that. Not then, not now, and certainly not at the end when supernatural signs will actually be a snare of, this, of Satan working for Antichrist and not for God. So be warned, be very, very careful. Don't chase after signs and wonders. Chase after the truth. It's those who love the truth who are saved, not those who have power. Okay. Now, let's move on. He says something really specific to them, right? He says in verse 6, Therefore Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you any time will do. The world cannot hate you, it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. So, remember how we started tonight, that we're in that cycle of autumn holy days. And they're in a particular order. And booths, tabernacles, which is what John 7 is saying is about to start, right? Is at the end, it's the last one. So as the story is unfolding, it's not quite time, right? They've still got time to get down to Jerusalem. So it's a week between Yom Kippur and booths. So... Jesus is saying to them, it's not my time yet, right? 
So he's not saying that there won't be a time. He's saying that that time is not now. You're too early. For what? Well, we'll see what the answer to that is in a moment. But the first thing to get clear in your mind is he's not saying that he won't ever go, but he is saying that what you want to happen, what you're trying to push me to do now, it's not the right time. And this is the big theme for tonight, right? Not that it isn't the right thing at some point, but it isn't the right thing now. And he's firm on it. And then he goes on to say something that's very important. He says, the world doesn't hate you, but it hates me because I am testifying to it that its works are evil. I'm convicting the world of sin. Right? And particularly when he's there in person, he's convicting the Jewish world of sin. We have to see what happens when Jesus goes back to the Father. And we find that, we're still in John, but we're going to zoom forward uh, to chapter 16. So John 16, verse 7. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says this. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. This is another example of where in their minds he should stay. You know, what we think is right. He says, no, no, I'm telling you absolutely. That's why it says very truly. He's like emphasizing it. It's for your good. In other words, the best thing that can happen now for you is if I leave. That's contrary to their expectation, right? They're like, what do you mean you're going? He says, no, no, actually, it's the best thing for you is that I leave. Because he says, unless I go away, the advocate, the Paracletes in, in um, Greek, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So what Jesus says is saying is, for what needs to happen next, you need the paracletes, it's a Greek word that is a little bit like, it means advocate, so a little bit like a lawyer. You know, <laughs> it's a mixture between like a teacher and a lawyer, someone who will advocate for you and, you know, work for your benefit, an advocate, right? And that advocate is the Holy Spirit, okay? He's Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of truth, right? Why? Why is he saying that? Well, one of the things Jesus gave up to come down and identify with us is God is what's called, the, the $20 word is omnipresent, meaning he can be everywhere at once. When Jesus took on bodily form, he can be in one place at a time. Jesus the Son we're talking about. He can be in one place at a time. Imagine if he had not ascended back to heaven and you wanted to go into your room and meet with him. You couldn't do it. Why? Well, he could only be in one place on earth at a time. In, in the flesh. Right? He goes back to the Father, and there's lots of other reasons why it's a whole Bible study in itself, but just focusing on this one aspect for the minute. It's better for us that he went back, and the Spirit who is echad with him, remember Elohim, God, is the plural word. God is a trinity, three parts, three individuals who are identical in every meaningful way. Right? So, for us, having the Holy Spirit with us is for all purposes that matter in this world the same as having Jesus with us. He is like the ultimate ambassador. He's so identical to Jesus in every meaningful way that we lose nothing by having the Spirit rather than the Son for now. Right? The difference is, the Spirit can be everywhere, 
at once. He could be talking to me answering my prayer in Wellington, New Zealand, while he's in Manila, while he's in Bulacan, while he's in Osaka, or he's in Nairobi, or wherever you're listening from. Jesus in the body can't do that, because he gave that up to be the Messiah, the Word in the flesh. So it's better for us that he went away, back to the Father, to be seated at his right hand, and that the Spirit of God steps into his shoes, so to speak, steps into the role, so that he can be everywhere at once, hear everyone at once, answer everyone at once, act for God everywhere, in every situation, at once. I hope that makes sense. Should do. Then the, the next part that's so important, verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, because people do not believe in Jesus about righteousness, because he's going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and judgment, because the prince of this world stands condemned already. This whole world stands condemned already. The full meaning of that we'll get to when we get to chapter 16, but just for the moment, understand why this is important to John 7. Before it's time for what booths, tabernacles, Sukkot, whatever you want to call it, before what that festival is about, can be fulfilled by Messiah, the things before it have to be fulfilled. Remember, it's in a particular order on the calendar, and this it comes last. What comes before it? The Day of Atonement, right? That's where those who God counts as obedient, their names are in the Book of Life, and those who are not are considered out of the covenant and cut off from God in the old days, at least for that year, right? That's a judgment. So the fulfillment of tabernacles is on the other side of the judgment from here. What's immediately before it? Well, what starts it? Yom Teruah, right? Trumpets. Called together for the days of war. The days of war go on for a long time before the judgment. In one sense, you know, in a certain way, we can say that we are in those days now and have been since Jesus went up. When he was in the world, he convicted the Jewish world exactly as he describes what the Spirit is going to do for all men. So if you like that conviction, remember what happens in the days of war, we're supposed to be examining ourselves and feeling convicted about our sin and dealing with it. God's goal, the goal of it with God is to bring us to repentance, right? Making us aware of our sin and the hope we'll turn back. Well, that's every day today, isn't it? Anyone who has the Spirit of God, according to Jesus in John 16, should experience conviction of sin. So for your good, the Spirit will convict you of sin in your life. So don't ignore it. Deal with it. He'll convict you of righteousness. So he won't just tell you what's wrong, he'll tell you what's right. He won't show you just where you are, he'll show you where you ought to be. And judgment, meaning he will impress upon you that it matters, because a day will come when the days of all will be over, when the time for being inspected or being convicted in the hope that you'll repent, those days will run out and it will suddenly be the day of atonement where your name is either in the Book of Life or not. you understand? That's what Jesus is really saying to them. You're jumping the gun, brothers. 
you're wanting me to go and deal with what Tabernacles is about, but actually we're way back here in the days of war. The whole world has to be convicted first, and generation upon generation has to go through that before what Booth's Tabernacles, so called, when you want to call it, can even come up on the calendar for fulfillment. That's what he's saying to them. And what he said, for you any time seems right, that's humanity to a T. It's like your own kids when they they don't just want something, they want it now. <laughs> and sometimes, you, you know, you want to give it to them, but not now. Other things might have to happen first. You might have to save up the money, for instance, or whatever it is. Okay. So it's not just what should happen, but when that's critical. So let's skip forward and look at what is Sukkot about. And then, as you understand it, I'm only going to give you a very simplistic version because, it, as I say, it's a, we've done it before, so hopefully most of you will know. But even if you don't, this will be enough for you to get enough of an idea to realize what Jesus is saying. So when God gave the law way back there in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and gave instruction requirements for these holy days throughout the calendar and he gave specific dates and so on in a specific order for them to be and what should take place at each thing. So right at the tail end is Sukkot. It gets its name from something called a sukkah. A sukkah is a temporary house. Okay, so um, a tent qualifies as a sukkah. It's a house, you could dwell in it, but plainly by its design, it's not intended to be a permanent dwelling. It's something you dwell in, usually while you're traveling, like you do with a tent, right? When would you take a tent? When you're on a trip. Why? Well, we're going to keep moving. So wherever we stop at night, we'll put the tent up and sleep in it. In the morning, we'll take the tent back down and move on. And then we'll put the tent up again, wherever we are. That's the idea of it, right? Hopefully, you've got a clue what this points to already. But let's have a look. So he initiated this festival as having two basic meanings. So we'll deal with the lesser one. This is the lesser meaning. Still valid, but it's the lesser in, in importance. In Israel's climate, you really get two quite separate harvest times. Because it's due when the rain falls. Which is the spring rains around Passover time and just before Passover. So the spring rains bring a harvest of barley and wheat. And all the studies we've done on uh, the fulfillment of the spring holy days, you know about first fruits and you know, which is the barley harvest, and you know about Shavuot, Pentecost, which is the wheat harvest, and all those things, which you can go back and review. You get next, it's summer, right? Summer's very hot and dry. It rains Occasionally a little bit here, a little bit there, but not consistently. For the most part it's dry. Right? Those of you who understand that the, the, the former and latter rains is a reference to the Holy Spirit poured out from heaven. It's no surprise to you then, human history. The Holy Spirit is everywhere doing all kinds of things in power at the beginning of the church. Like you read of an act. Why? Because it's spring. It's the beginning of the year. It's the beginning of the overall cycle. Because remember, the Jewish year is a picture of the whole of human history once Messiah comes. So the early church experiences the spring rains, the, the early rain. So there's initially a big harvest. So remember, in the first of those harvests is the barley. So the bigger harvest is... Excuse me if you don't know this, so it's, there's another whole Bible study. 
We know the barley harvest points of the Gentiles. But surprise, surprise, whilst the church grows rapidly amongst Jews, it's nothing compared to how quickly it grows amongst Gentiles. Because the barley harvest comes first, right? Which points to the Gentiles, as I are saying. So in the first century or two or three of the church, the early season, the harvest is enormous. Christianity spreads like wildfire. There's nothing the Roman Empire does that's able to suppress it. And in the end, the Roman Empire gives in and becomes Christian. And before you know it, most of the known world is Christian. But it still is to this day, contrary to what people think. But then, the summer. It only rains now and again, not all the time, and not always in the same place. If you look at the history of the church, by the time you get to sort of the 4th and 5th centuries up to recent times, you get occasional outpourings of the Spirit, what people call revivals. Not always in the same place. And it doesn't last long. So the rain comes, the, the Holy Spirit poured out, in a certain place for, for a reasonably short time, and there's a mini harvest there. But because it's summer, the rain doesn't stay. So you get a mini harvest, a flourishing of Christianity, which like replants or revitalizes Christianity in that place, and then the rain stops, and it goes back to being like the rest of the Christian world after that. So that's why people who, who imagine that you can have revival that just goes on and on, that's contrary to scripture and contrary to God's order of things. You need to understand it in terms of meteorology, right? In the summer, the rain only falls now and again, here and there, never all the time in one place. Then you get to the latter rain, which is what the book of Joel speaks about. But the latter rain, when it falls, this is the last big harvest of the year, right? Sukkot is connected to that. It's giving, bringing in, it, it coincides in Israel with when the latter rains have fallen and really kicked off massive growth in uh, fruit trees and things like that. You know, so you get a second big agricultural harvest in the autumn, different from the wheat and the barley of the spring. But it's a big harvest. And it's at Sukkot that you bring your sacrifices and your thanksgiving and everything for the second harvest run. The second harvest is not primarily Gentile anymore, now it's primarily Jewish. That's why the Gentile church grows massively at the beginning and slowly dies off. By the time Sukkot comes for fulfillment, by the time the, the latter rains fall, it's falling mainly on the Jews. Which means the Gentile church is finished. The time of the Gentiles, as it talks about, is about done. There's some reason to believe there may be some overlap, so we might see some part of it, but it's not primarily for us. The latter rains are primarily for the Jewish, the unsaved Jewish people. It's to bring them to repentance. Remember the Holy Spirit poured out, if people think about it as signs and wonders and power, right? What did Jesus say? When the Spirit comes, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit poured out on the Jewish nation in power is primarily to bring them to repentance to Christ. It's a very scary time, you know, really super scary, the time of Jacob's trouble. But it's also the time of the two witnesses who can call down any curse they like on God's enemies which you'll find this in the book of Revelation, right? And they have that power by the, by the Holy Spirit poured out at that time, the latter rain. My point being, everything Sukkot is about is about the very end, which is mostly Jewish. So the harvest part of this festival 
has to do with the last big harvest in the cycle, which is the remnant of Jacob, the Jews. God does not forget his covenant, even though they rejected him at the beginning. He satisfies his own promise in the end. Okay, So if you're a Gentile church looking for the latter rain, you've got problems in the end. He may send you a revival, he may send the Holy Spirit to you, but not in the way that Joel is talking about. That is to do with Jerusalem, that's to do with saving the Jews at the end. Okay? But that's its lesser meaning. It's bigger meaning, it's related, okay, but this is its primary meaning. And this is what they'll teach the kids, right? When it's time for Sukkot, which goes on for 10 days, I think it is, I have to remind myself now I've forgotten, but every family, every Jewish family, is required every year at this time to build a sukkah, one of these temporary houses. And it's specified that you have to build it out of four different kinds of plant, kind of tree, okay? The one that Christians are most familiar with, and especially Western Christians are most familiar with, is something called a lulav. A lulav is a kind of palm tree. So you take these palm branches, and they form one of the four types of, of tree to build this little hut, you know, a little temporary dwelling. Like a, like a little cabin or a little hut, right? You must use these four different types, and each of the different types means something in Midrash. But just now, we're going to talk about the lulav, the palm branches. At the temple, what do they do at Sukkot? They dance around, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means Hoshna, Lord save us. Right? Lord save us, Lord save us, and glance what they've got in their hands. They're waving lulav, palm branches. Right? Does that sound familiar to you? It should do. That's what they were doing when Jesus rode on the donkey into Jerusalem at Passover. They were doing at Passover what you're supposed to do at Sukkot. It's the same thing we've just been talking about. They were not prepared to wait. They were impatient. They were like the brothers. <laughs> they were like NAR people today, Dominionists today. Well, you're the Messiah. Bring in the kingdom. Why wait? You know, isn't it best? Just do the miracles. You can do anything. They wanted him to defeat the Romans get on the throne of David and bring in the eternal kingdom at the first coming. That's why even though it was at Passover, these are Jewish people, they, know, they knew exactly what they were doing. There they are, as he rode into the city, doing what might sound random when you read it, right? It's not random at all. It's from Sukkot, Tabernacles, the other end of the year. And its meaning is summarized like this they are yelling at him fulfill tabernacles even though it's passover that's what they're saying to him don't wait what did jesus say to his brother brothers any time seems right to you you know you you want to ignore the order that god has made plain you want you're so impatient you won't wait. You don't care about all the other people who who would never enter the kingdom if I do it now. So it amounts to. You just want what it for you now. You don't really care about your neighbour, do you? You're not ready to wait. You're not ready for God's will to unfold God's way in God's time. You just want it now. You want the kingdom now. That's why it, you know, you might have picked up I'm not impressed with Dominionists and not impressed at all with NAR people and things like that because they don't understand how uncaring they are. They don't understand how completely selfish and uncaring and unloving they really are. If they really cared about their neighbour as God requires, they would say, Lord, your will, your way, in your time, 
for the sake of that person that I don't even know, that if it all happened too quickly, that they could not be reached in time or made ready in time, they'd be lost. Because it's about more than me. It's about more than my family, more than my church, more than my country, more than my generation. You know? It's about every living soul that you can save before there's no one left to save. Your time, your way, your agenda, Lord. Everyone has to build a suka, every family, for the whole week. They take their meals in it, and they have Bible study every day in it. There's a prescribed series of Bible studies that they, the fathers will teach the children. Because this is all to remind them annually, so that they never forget what this is about. And the hub of the story is that how God brought them out of Egypt. So the Passover story, right? How he brought them out. He didn't bring them straight into the Promised Land. For 40 years in the wilderness, he led them. And in that time, he gave them the law. He gave them bread every day. He gave them water from the rock, etc., etc., etc. Right? That's your Christian life, in case you don't know that. The book of Exodus teaches us about being Christians here. You left Egypt already when you were saved initially, but you're not yet in the kingdom. God had to teach you his law about himself, what his requirements are. He has to change you. The old creation cannot enter the kingdom. The old creation has to be killed off by the cross and replaced with a new creation that knows how to live in the kingdom. He has to make the bride ready for the wedding. So you don't immediately leap from Satan's kingdom to heaven. First there's a wilderness to cross. And in that wilderness, he made them live in Sukkah. Why? Why would you live in a temporary house? Easy. The wilderness is not your permanent home. So let go of it. Stop thinking of this world as it. Stop thinking of your life in this world as the only life you'll ever have. Stop thinking of this world as the only chance you'll ever have to enjoy yourself or have meaning or any of that, right? Because it's the wilderness. Stop thinking of your house as the most important thing in your life. Stop thinking about your job or your money or all of this. None of it is permanent. Everything that God gives you for the wilderness crossing is only temporary for the wilderness. It's part of the, the sukkah. What does Sukkot, the festival that goes with this, this story, what does it teach in the end? Well, it's about how for the crossing you have a temporary home, but not forever. Because eventually the 40 years were over and they emerged into the promised land and cut a long story short. All of that points to the fact that this world as we know it, this wilderness, is not forever. Not for the individual and not for mankind altogether. This world stands condemned. It is not permanent. This world, God will destroy it completely in the end and replace it with a new heaven and a new earth. Right? This is not home. That's why we are considered to be in the world, but not of it. Remember when Jesus prayed for his disciples? We're physically here, but we don't belong here. This is not home. So treat it as a place you're passing through. Because if you're a Christian, that's all it is. We're just passing through. Home lies ahead. Peace, happiness, and all of the abundance of things that you long for here are not for here. They're for home. Here is the wilderness. We're not supposed to get comfortable here. That's why God allows this world to be harsh to us, so that we don't get comfortable and sit down and think that this is it. You know? What good would it be if the Israelites all sat down in the middle of the desert and said, this will do, we'll just live here. 
it's just die, right? We are the same. That's why that's why the scripture says those who persevere will be saved. Those who keep walking. Why? Because those who are saved walk out the other side. They don't sit down in the wilderness and think this will do. That's what backsliders do. You know, that's what backsliding is. That's when you say, oh, I'll just live in this world. Never mind. I know it's better in the next world, but I can't be bothered walking. I'll just, I'll just be happy with this world. You can't be happy with this world. This is the wilderness. Remember? It's barren. It's dusty. It's dry. It's full of poisonous snakes and scorpions. You know? It's as simple as that. On the last day of the week, the last scripture that a Jewish dad will share before the process is over, he'll hold the word of God in his hand and he'll place, he'll gather his sons particularly, but usually the whole family, and he'll place one hand on the sukkah and holding the word of God in the other hand. And he quotes from Isaiah 14, Yeshiahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet, right? And at the beginning, remember you make these things, you go and cut the branches and you make this, weave this thing together, this hut, right? So at the beginning of the week, it's all green and leafy. But it's the Middle East, okay? What do you think it looks like at the end of the week? By the end of the week, it's all brown and wilting and hanging down and bits falling off it everywhere. Because, it, you know, in the sun, it's so harsh that nothing will stay green after a week the thing is already drying out wanting to fall down right that's a picture of this world it started off green it ends barren rotten to the core unable beyond repair you know by the time the kingdom of antichrist is in full swing what is the state of the world like to utter ruin and decay. It's what the young people of the day already sense with you know with climate change and all the rest of it. They can already sense that this world is running down. That the future is ultimately that this world will stop. The law of entropy if you're a scientist, okay? That all systems eventually run down to zero. That's what the Sukkah is meant to tell them. So he'll hold the word of God in one hand and he'll put his hand on this now dry and, you know, falling to pieces brown thing that was the hut. And he quotes from Isaiah, and here we go, Isaiah 40, starting at verse 6. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of God endures forever. The breath of God blows on them and they wither up. It's talking about what happens at the end. By God's word, Antichrist arises. Remember, he's sent by God as the beginning of judgment. Get it out of get out of your head any idea that Satan can act independently of God. He can't do anything God doesn't permit him. He is an agency of God's judgment. Okay? So it's contrary to God's character, that's why God doesn't do it himself. But he's sent by God with God's authority to do God's purpose, which is to start to punish this fallen world that rejects Jesus. The breath of God blowing on the grass causes it to wither. That's what that means. The word of God endures forever. If you are a real Christian, you and Jesus and Jesus and you by the Spirit, then you have, then you have a connection you are not the Messiah, you're not the Word in the flesh, but you're part of His body. The Word is living and active in you and through you if you're a real Christian. Therefore, that sense of eternity, the Word of our God endures forever, has its expression 
in the Christians who are connected to and live by the word. You're eternal. This world will perish like the Sukha. Started off green, ends up beyond repair. That's this world. That's what Sukkot is about. It says that in the end, in the end, God's people will no longer live in these impermanent, decaying situations. That in the end you'll leave the wilderness for a permanent home. That's why they only live in it for a week. They come out of it go back into their house. That's the teaching. That's why each generation of kids learns every year. That God brought them through the wilderness for 40 years, living them in these temporary dwellings, only to bring them into a permanent home in the land he promised them. That's a picture of heaven, a new heaven and a new earth, right? Now, you can understand then what Jesus means when he says, My time is not yet. You can hopefully now understand that for tabernacles to be fulfilled, our dwelling in the wilderness and our temporary dwelling, if you're wondering what your personal sukha is, your personal temporary dwelling, this thing, your body, it's not permanent. The scripture says that when we are raptured or resurrected, when we appear before him, we are in a new body. A permanent one. This one decays. You know, if you're really old, you know that well. <laughs> you know, you go to a graveyard and dig up someone who's been buried for 300 years and see what state that body's in. This is a temporary dwelling, this thing. Thank goodness for that, right? It's not your permanent home for your spirit. Your spirit will have a permanent home, but not yet. This body we live in is like a sukha, a temporary dwelling for us to travel in, in this world which is not our permanent home. So when Jesus says, I can't go there and do that, what you want me to do, because my time is not yet. What he means is, it's not time for Sukkot to be fulfilled. Because when Sukkot's fulfilled, it means the time of the Sukkah is over. The time of the temporary dwelling is over. The wilderness journey is over. And as a nation, as a people, all those in Christ will come into their permanent dwelling place. Obviously, the second coming has to happen before that is fulfilled. Because it really is the end. The new heaven and the new earth. The end of the book of Revelation even. So we are, we are still a long way short of that. It wasn't time for Sukkot to be fulfilled that year, and it's not time this year. So a lot still has to happen. We're still in the days of awe leading up to judgment, up to when those whose names are in the Book of Life will be considered redeemed by the blood of the scapegoat, John Kippur we talked about before. The key thing I want you to understand is God established the order of the festivals because it points to the order in which these things must happen for all people, not just the Jews. Let's look at the next thing. He says, this is back in verse 8, he says, you go to the festival, and we know why now because it's the Jewish, it's the law of Moses, so when he's, he's not saying it as a suggestion, he's reminding them, you guys have to go, you're Jewish, you don't, off you go, it's festival time, you must go, it's one of those three times a year you must go, so as you go to the festival, I am not going up to this festival, because my time has not yet fully come, in English, it sounds like he's saying, I've decided not to go, that would make Jesus a lawbreaker. If that's the interpretation, that would make Jesus saying to his brothers, I'm the Messiah, but I'm not going to keep God's law. Remember, the context is so important. Every Jewish male must attend. So the first thing you know, 
Jesus is without blemish, without spot, without sin, which means he cannot possibly mean that. What does he mean then? By mean that, I mean he cannot possibly be saying, I just decided not to go. That would be in direct disobedience of the law of Moses. So he can't mean that. So what does he mean? Well, a little bit of Jewishness for you, which will explain. Is that scripture? I'm going to go to, if you've got your Bibles out, you can get to uh, the prophet Micah, or Micah if you prefer, it's Micah actually. Micah 4, verse 1. We'll come to that in a second, right? What's to do with the end? So, the first thing to understand is where does, to, to go there, he has to go to Jerusalem and he has to go to the temple, right? The actual um, festival happens at the temple in Jerusalem. He says something specific though. He says, I am not going up to this festival. What does that mean? Why does he say going up? But it's not random, okay? It's very important. It's a very Jewish thing. And it has meaning. So he says, I am not going up to the festival. My time has not yet fully come. So the temple site, you know there's no temple there at the moment, right? There's just the Dome of the Rock, al Mosque. The whole site where the temple was is completely Muslim right now. If you go to Jerusalem, there's no temple to see, just the Dome of the Rock, the second most important um, uh, Islamic site after Mecca. And next to it is a huge mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is all on the, the top of this hill, right? And it's all up to this very day. The whole top is, if you're Christian or Jewish, you cannot go out, you cannot even go there without specific approval. And even if you do go there, you're not allowed to pray or do anything religious at all of any nature. If you're Jewish or Christian, it's the law. Actually, it's the law of Israel. Okay? You think, what? It's not just that the Muslims won't let you, it's that the Israeli government will not let you disobey the Islamic rule on that place. You might think that's crazy. Why don't they just change it, right? God. God is why. Let me tell you a story, a true story. Right? 1967, the Arab armies of Syria, Egypt, and Lebanon, uh, not Lebanon, Jordan, simultaneously attacked Israel with the intent of wiping them out, of basically exterminating them and removing Israel as a country, right? Well, God had other ideas. He had covenants to keep, right? Part of what happened, though, is when the UN created the modern state of Israel, they split Jerusalem in two. And half of it was in Israel, and the other half was in what you might call Palestine, the Arab half, right? Temple Mount, where the temple had stood, which has the Dome of the Rock on it, Alexa Mosque, was unsurprisingly in East Jerusalem, it was in the Arab part. So it's in the Muslim part, right? Of where the UN drew the line. But because the Arabs attacked, the Israelis defended themselves with God's help. Well, they didn't just succeed in defending themselves. The totally outnumbered Jewish forces drove three Arab armies back so far that the whole West Bank, that you hear about in the news all the time, they captured the whole West Bank of the Jordan, which was, had been part of Jordan, this country of Jordan. They captured the Golan Heights, and which is, had been Syrian. And they captured all the rest of traditional Israel, including the rest of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount. And very famously, if you're a... Um, 
if you are Israeli, the soldiers that have the most fame in Israel are the paratroopers. And part of their fame, why the Israeli paratroopers are revered so much, is that they fought the most ferocious battle, unbelievably ferocious battle, uh, but succeeded in capturing Temple Mount. Because you imagine how much the Muslims tried to defend it as their holy site for Islam, right? So they defended it tooth and nail. But God was with the Israelis, the Jews. And the Israeli paratroopers fought their way up to the top of Temple Mount. And here's the thing not many people understand. When they got to the top, when they had total control of Temple Mount, they brought up explosives. The paratroopers fully intended to absolutely blow up all of the Islamic buildings on top. Because for, for them, these were an abomination. Remember what we said, the whole theme of this? There is a way that seems right to you, a time that seems right to you, you know, in your own mind. But God says, no, that's not my agenda. That's not my time. My ways are higher than your ways, remember? What he says, well, you would think there'd be protests from the Arabs, right? But they were too busy running away. They had fought as hard as they could and they lost. And when they, when they had to run, they had to run, right? So there's nothing stopping the Israeli paratroopers from blowing those buildings that you see there today into tiny little pieces and reclaiming the whole Temple Mount for Israel. Except up the hill comes a single man and they cannot ignore him because he is the chief rabbi of Israel, the chief rabbi, Jewish priest of the whole of Israel. He's the chief. And he orders them to stop. He doesn't just order them to stop. He orders them to give over the key that they've captured for the, the keys of the buildings. And then he orders them off the Temple Mount. And he negotiates with the King of Jordan in the end. And the keys are given to the Jordanians. And to this day, there's a special Jordanian organization in charge of the Temple Mount. And so the chief rabbi of Israel stops the Islamic buildings being blown up and then gives the keys to back to the Muslims. Why? Because God, our God, brought him under such conviction he thought he was going to die <laughs> if he didn't run there and stop them. God says, back off. God says, give the keys back. You might think that's crazy. It wasn't crazy to the chief rabbi. It's not crazy to the Israeli government to this very day. They understood that no matter what they thought, their God, the God of Abraham, said no. You might think, why? Why? <laughs> Imagine what they'd do. Imagine what they would have done if God had not stopped them. They would have leveled that place, right? Making permanent war with Islam, by the way, straight away. They would have tried rebuilding the temple because scripture tells us that Messiah must re-enter the temple when he returns. So there has to be a temple there at the end. But if they tried rebuilding the temple, what does that sound like? It's kingdom now talk again. It's, it's waving the lulav when it's only Passover again. It's go and do some miracles here, then, you know, then they will believe you. It's taking shortcuts. It's ignoring what else God has said has to happen. It's trying to jump straight to the end and to force God's hand into bringing about the kingdom before he's finished before he's fulfilled everything he's already spoken through the prophets. And just as importantly, before he's dealt with every living soul 
to give them their chance before that happens. Because once there is a temple there, it's Antichrist who will come and rule from it first. He sets up an abomination that causes desolation in it. And he takes over control of the, word, the world, ruling a worldwide church from it. Because remember, the site is holy to um, Jews, Christians and Muslims. Between Jews, Christians and Muslims, only 16% of the world's population do not fall into one of those three categories. So if you rule from the site that represents the three largest religions in the world, you know, in what is their holy place to them. It's how you get to be head of a worldwide church. Where else would you rule from? So there will be a temple, but scripture tells us the first one to rule from it, attempt to rule the world from it, will be Antichrist. Okay? Does God want to accelerate that ahead of time? No, of course not. So he sent the chief rabbi to stop them blowing it up. Because it acts like a giant handbrake. As long as those Islamic buildings are on top of Temple Mount, they can't build the temple. So long as there's no temple, Antichrist can't come. Can he? You understand? Not until God's ready. Everything has to be ready. Everything has to be prepared. Everything has to be in its place. So, for, in God's purpose, the Dome of the Rock and the al aqsa Mosque and all that Islamic control of Temple Mount, his holy hill, is God's purpose, God's handbrake, to stop humans, his own people, running ahead of him. At the proper time, those buildings will be gone and a temple will take its place, but that will set off such conflict that the time of Jacob's trouble will follow won't be a good time, be a terrible time. Not until God's ready, you understand? Now we come to that scripture that I asked you to, if you got your Bibles, Micah 4, about the Temple Mount. So it says there, this is speaking of end times, right? The end. The prophet Micah says, And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of mountains. In other words, the highest, the place of highest authority in the world will be there. Well, as I said, Antichrist is the first one to pull that off. It will be raised above the hills. The peoples, plural, will stream to it. So all nations will stream to it. Global control from there. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, yes. In the end, though Antichrist tries to rule the world from it first, when Jesus comes back, where does he come back? Jerusalem. Where does he go? Into the temple. Why? Because it's from there that he will rule the whole earth for the millennial reign. Micah 4 will be fulfilled. It says, come let us go up. Go up. This is a very Jewish thing. No matter which direction you approach, Jerusalem itself, the whole of Jerusalem, is built on a series of hills. Temple Mount is the dominant one that had the temple on it. So when the temple was standing, it didn't matter from which direction you approached, you could see the temple on the hill from any direction you approached Jerusalem. You could see the temple up there on the, on the hill, on, they call it a mountain. It's not that high actually, but they call it a mountain. Temple Mount, right? So in Jewish speech, if you're going to temple, particularly if you're going to temple to, to meet with God, and particularly if you're going to fulfill an obligation under the law, 
To reach the temple, you have to climb. It doesn't matter from what direction you came, you have to climb. It's at the top of this mountain itself amongst all these hills, right? So in Jewish speech, you always say that you are going up to Jerusalem, because most of it's on top of hills. And most particularly, you will say that you're going up to temple to deal, so to go and meet with God in a Jewish way of speaking, you always say you are going up to do business with God, going up. This is the same language Jesus is using. He says, because it's not yet my time, my time is not fully here, and it says fully here, that's really significant. He's saying, I am the Messiah, I'm starting to do things, I'm starting to tick off the list. But my time is not fully finished, so I'm not up to Sukkot yet, nor will I be for a long time. That's what he's saying by it's not fully here. It means that things have begun, but we're not at the end, and Sukkot is the end. He says, for that reason I am not going up to this festival. That's the meaning that what we were just talking about is the context of his choice of words. He isn't just a man. Every Jewish man must attend. But he's more than that. He's Messiah. He is the one that the scripture says will fulfill Sukkot and bring in the kingdom, the permanent home that we spoke of. So we'll be no longer living in a kind of temporary existence in temporary bodies, etc. It's Jesus that brings in the permanent and eternal kingdom with your permanent and eternal perfect body, etc. If he goes up to Sukkot, the Jewish way of understanding that would, in his identity as Messiah means he's going up to fulfill his obligations under the law as Messiah at Sukkot. It's a Jewish way, it's, it's his Jewish way of saying it's not his time to go and fulfill it as Messiah. So when he says, I'm not going up, he doesn't mean he's not going. He's not going as Messiah. It's probably confusing. I'm really trying to think how to explain it. This is a very Jewish thing. So his particular choice of words tells you he's got his Messiah identity on. Remember, the scripture talks about him two ways that sound the same but they're different. Son of God, Son of Man. Whatever the second word is, tells you what he's identifying with. If it talks about him as the son of God, it means he's acting in reflection of his father. If it talks about him as son of man, it means he's identifying with us. He's active, acting, reflecting us. Right? Bearing that in mind, what this business of him saying, I'm not going up to this festival, He's speaking as the Son of God, as Messiah. That's why he's not lying when he says to his brothers, I'm not going, but then he goes. He wasn't lying to them. He's saying, he's speaking as Messiah, saying it's not my time to go up to Sukkot to fulfill my obligation under the law as Messiah. It's not time for that. But he is going as Jesus, the Son of Man, a Jewish man. He's still obligated under the law to go. So he goes. Does that make sense? I hope so. It's a bit of a tricky thing to get your head around if you're not used to Jewish things, but anyway. It says here in verse 10, picking up from what we just said, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, which remember they had no choice, they had to go, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Not publicly, but in secret. Now, that gives you the idea in English that he kind of snuck in like some secret agent, you know, wearing a disguise or something like that. 
But we know that's not true from what we'll do next time. He's teaching in the temple. He's, he's actually in openly there, right? He's not hiding. So this business in secret doesn't mean what it seems to say in English, as if he is like he's snuck into town and he's hiding in the shadows and wearing a disguise or something, right? He, the rest of John 7 tells you the opposite of that. He's not hiding. What, is it, what does it mean then? You know, he says here, not publicly, but in secret. Well, we have to go to the Greek again. It said, the word is phaneros. He went not phaneros, meaning, and the, that Greek word means manifestly, obviously. Remember, we're still talking about him as Messiah. He's still speaking, this whole section of scripture is still pointing to his identity as Messiah. But rather, this word, kryptos. Kryptos is the mean to, to keep something covered over, to keep it hidden. In English, actually, it's really simple. But, it, you know, I know it's not always easy to, to see it in English, but once you look at the Greek, it's easy. What this means is, his identity as Messiah, when he went, he didn't manifestly appear the Messiah. He didn't, because he's not going to fulfill it, right? He can't go to this uh, festival of tabernacles as Messiah to fulfill it, because it's not time. He can only go as a Jewish man. He can't go identifying with God. He can only go identifying with us. Meeting his obligations under his father's law for every Jewish man to attend. So his identity as Messiah, he does not manifest. He keeps it hidden. He goes just as a Jewish man, a rabbi at least. You know, But he doesn't do any of the things that Messiah has to do to fulfill Sukkot that he is, in fact, the one who's going to fulfill it in the end, he keeps hidden. That's what that means. So he hasn't lied to his brothers. In English, we'd just say, you would say, he says to his brothers, I am the Messiah, but it's not time for that to be fulfilled, so I can't go there as Messiah. I'll just go as a Jewish man, because we all have to go. It's the law. You understand? I hope so. I hope so. Because we wouldn't want anyone thinking that he was lying to his brothers because he didn't do that. Last little bit, just to finish off. Verse 11. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, Where is he? Where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Someone sa some said, He's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leases. Okay, what's this is about? Well, it's pretty simple, really. The leaders, they, they know that you can't be in Israel and not hear about the miracles. You can't be in Israel and not hear about what he's teaching. Some of the Pharisees, some of the Sanhedrin, already believe that he's the Son of God. Nicodemus and the watch, right? So when you think of the Sanhedrin as being against them, it's not universal. There are believers amongst the Sanhedrin already. And those who are against them, even they will have doubt about their position. They've been hotly against them, right? They'll be doubting. There'd be a little bit of worry, what if he is? What if it is him? Well, just like those Jews with their palm branches in their hands at Passover, under the Roman rule, under everything that they remember before them, before the Romans had been the Greeks, it's been a long, long time since Israel was really ruled, 
securely, safely and permanently by anybody Jewish. Not really since the time of King David had they known real prosperity and power as a nation, a Jewish nation. It's their own fault, of course, that all, all the things that went wrong is because of their own sin and rebellion. So it's nothing to do with any shortfall of God, only of themselves. However, even the Sanhedrin, right, deep down, what do they want? They want the kingdom. What do they want? They want the David on his throne. Again, all the promises made to the patriarchs, all the promises made through the prophets. They are actually desperate for the Romans to be gone, desperate for Israel to be great again, and so on, right? So that's why it says here, they understand, no one understands the meaning of Sukkot better than the, than the Pharisees. You have to understand the Pharisees were experts in the law. That's why God chose one of them to be Paul. <laughs> you don't get an amateur. The Pharisees were the experts in the law. Nobody understood what Sukkot really meant better than the Pharisees, right? So the Jewish leadership dominated by the Pharisees, they, they're aware that it's tabernacles. They're aware that that is all about the coming kingdom. They know what it points to and what it means. If there's any, even the tiniest doubt in their mind that this Jewish man, Jesus, Yeshua, what if he's really the Messiah? Deep down, they're all hoping that he'll turn up and fulfill it. Because if he is the Messiah, they're just like the brothers. What if he turns up and fulfills it? That'll be the kingdom. That'll be the Romans gone, etc., etc. So that's why it says they're all looking to see if he's going to turn up. They're all expected. Is he going to come? And if he comes, what's he going to do? Because deep down, they're like the Dominionists, the NAR people today. They don't really care about God's timetable or agenda. They just want the kingdom now. They're not prepared to wait. They just want it now. Right? That's really what that means. So the whole of the Jewish nation, remember virtually every Jewish male in the whole land is there, in Jerusalem, because it's a pilgrim feast, right? They all heard about him. Where is he? Has anyone seen him? Is he here? Is he going to do it? Is it him? Is he the one? But no one wants to be seen taking absolute sides. When it says no one spoke publicly, it's that same word that the brothers used. Parousia, which means to be so convincing, so certain, as to leave a lasting and permanent impression, a lasting and permanent witness. No one wanted to commit, in other words, how it's probably how we would put it today. Why? Because it wasn't God's time for that. So as we'll see next time, he does turn up because he's a Jewish man identifying with us. Jesus, the Son of Man, has to turn up to obey his father's law. He didn't break any laws, remember? Of course he was coming. Of course he had to do that. He just didn't turn up as Messiah. He just didn't turn up as the one who will, in the end, fulfill Sukkot, fulfill the law that Sukkot is about. He'll do that, but not yet. Not then, not not in uh, the 3rd of September, uh, 3rd of October, sorry. 3rd of October is the beginning of Sukkot this year, 2021. So if it's this year that the kingdom comes, that's when he should start to fulfill it, on the 3rd of October. But it won't be. Why? Because Antichrist hasn't come first. Because there's no temple yet on Temple Mount and a massive list of other things. So my point is this. We must get rid of all this impatience. Things we think God should do. We should stop lecturing God what we think he ought to do and be asking him, Lord, what are you doing? Take me with you. 
your agenda, your timing, your order of events, so that as many as are saved as could possibly have been saved, not people lost because I wasn't ready to wait enough time for them to be bought as well. God wants as many saved as possible. He will take all the time he needs so that no one is left behind that didn't need to be. That no one is lost that didn't need to be. Do you understand? Bring your petitions. Bring your sincere requests. But like Jesus, when he says, nevertheless your will and not mine be done, understand what that means. It's not that your prayer is wrong. It's not that what you're seeking is wrong or evil. In fact, it may well be what God wants for you and for mankind in the end. But like the wilderness that we have to cross first, all these things have other things that have to happen first on the way. On the way. God is not a sloppy builder, you know. He builds a brick at a time and he makes sure that brick is in properly before he puts another one. The house he builds endures forever. You know that? Satan can't knock it down. What God builds endures forever. So I guess that's our theme. In your personal prayer, in your corporate prayer and witness as a church, do your best to learn God's order, what has to happen at first, second and third. Accept that he knows you want the kingdom now. And he would do it if it wouldn't destroy people he wants to save. He won't break his testimony. He won't be found to have lied. He won't leave anything out that he said has to happen first. Okay? that won't change. Nothing will change that. So, settle down. Okay? That's my message to you. Settle down. Don't be in a hurry to force God's hand. You're wasting your time. When it's time, nothing can stop it. When it is time, for each step, nothing, not Satan and everything that serves him, has the, the slightest prayer of stopping God doing it. Okay, so when it's time, rest assured, all these things will come to pass. Because there's nothing in creation that can stop the Creator from doing as He pleases. But the flip side is also true. Your creation cannot force the Creator to do anything He's not ready to do, or isn't right to do, in His own eyes on his own agenda, okay? And the faster we get used to that, the better. The faster we say, teach me your will, Lord, that I may walk in it. Give me your heart that I might share it. Give me the right burden and expectation for today so that I'm walking with you, not running ahead of you and not dragging my feet behind you either. Everything according to his word according to his order of things, according to his timetable, not a minute late, and certainly not a minute early, because he is perfect and he does everything perfectly for our good. Well, that's it for me for tonight, so shalom, there's the camera there, shalom, blessings in Jesus for the week ahead, probably... There's an announcement on Monday what will happen to the, level, to the levels, but uh, I guess we're not holding our breath. Probably next week we'll be in the same situation. We'll have to be online again, but who knows? God surprises sometimes. Let's see. In the meantime, please take all these things to heart. Study it. Uh, those of you on the email group, you've got, you can print this out and share it with people. Otherwise, it's on Facebook. You can read it from there. But of course, there's a few things that I skipped over quickly that you can gain from when you do the reading yourself. So 
they take these things to heart, they're quite important for the age that we live in, and that's it. Okay, good night now, from New Zealand, shalom.